Can you see my screen? Uh, you can see. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, Thank sir. you. So in the last class, uh, we looked at rule, rules of inference, uh, and especially we looked at a proposition logic. Uh, today, uh, I will first start with rules of inference for quantifiers, I mean quantified statements, uh, and then we'll go for the normal forms, and then the logic will be done, the logic syllabus will be done. Uh, then we'll start new chapter, okay? So, Okay, so rules of inference. For quantified statements. So I'll just summarize as a table and uh, that should be enough for us. Okay. So here is a Inference and name. For every x, px, and therefore pc for some specific x is equal to c. Okay, so if this is true, this uh, therefore pc is true. So this is known as universal. instantization okay second rule pc is true for an arbitrary c for an arbitrary c therefore it is true for every x x right if something is true for arbitrary c it will be true for all x so this is known as universal generalization okay next there exists x px Use x p x. If this is true, therefore p c is true for some c, right? Because some c which exists, you know, so this is known as existential. Instance stage. Okay. And finally, uh, we have the last one. If PC is true for some C, for some C, therefore, they used X says that PX is true. Right. So this is also known as existential. Generalization. So these are the four rules of inference for uh, quantified statement. So I'm going to give you one example now, and uh, then we can conclude this rules of inference section. Okay. So I hope it is clear. For every x, p x is true. Therefore, p c is true because the x uh, c is the specific case of it. If p c is true for an arbitrary c, then therefore it is true for every x of p x. There exists x p x if true if this is true for some x that means p c is true for some c right I mean x equal to c 
if pc is true for some c therefore there exists x px is true so these are the four rules let us take an example here so that the premise is everyone in this in this discrete math class has taken a course in computer science and marla is a student in this class imply the conclusion Marla has taken a course in computer science. Okay, so what we can do here, we can figure out the statement. Suppose dx is x is in this discrete math. Discrete math class. Right, and suppose Cx, X has taken a course in computer science. Okay, these two statements are there. This implies that uh, the premises are for every x, dx implies cx and d marla. Right. So here we can do the reasoning here, a step and reason. First, for every x, dx implies this cx. So x is, a, x is in this discrete math class, will imply that x has taken a course in computer science. This is your image. Second, p of Marla. When x equal to Marla implies this C of Marla. So this is the universal inst instantiation from one. That rule we have used. Rule one. Then third D Marla. That's the premise. Fourth, C Marta. This is true. This is basically orders bonus from two and three. Right. And so, so that is we concluded that uh, Marla has taken a course in computer science. So this is a, this was a very simple thing actually. Uh, now we are going to do uh, certain normal forms uh, and
Okay, normal forms. So first of all, uh, so there are two kinds of normal form, disjective normal form and conjective normal form. Uh, first, I will define what is WFF, okay? Well-formed formula, known as well-formed formula. What is WFF? So well-formed formula of proposition logic is a string consisting of proposition variables. Then we have connectives and parasynthesis. Okay, used in, uh, so example are actually here. We can write down some examples. Means brackets, you know, parentheses means bracket. So here are some examples. P join Q meet negation of P join Q join R meet negation of S join Q is a well formed formula. So here uh, E join Q negation of S is a disjunction. Join disjunction basically also known as sum p meet negation of q meet r is a conjunction basically we also call it product okay finally a product of variables and their negation in a formula is called an elementary product. So a product of variables and their negation in a formula is called an elementary product. Example, negation of P meet Q, Q meet R meet negation of S or simply Q, okay? So these are examples of elementary product. Similarly, we can define what is known as uh, elementary sum so a sum of variables and their negation is called as an elementary sum Example, negation of P join Q or plus Q, Q join P join S or P. These are example of elementary sum. Now, since we know that, since a variable or the negation of a variable is called a literal. I think we gave you this definition some time back. Literal. Therefore, an elementary sum is a disjunction 
of literals and an elementary product is a conjunction of literals okay so so these are some uh, important definitions actually uh, now we can actually give you the actual uh, definition of dnf or what is known as destructive normal form a formula which is equivalent to a given formula consisting of of a sum of elementary products is called a disjunctive normal form or DNF okay so let us take an example find dnf of p implies this q meet negation of q now you see that p implies this q we start with meet negation of q this is same thing as as you remember p implies q is same thing as negation of p join q meet negation of q right and then using the distributive law this is same thing as negation of p meet negation of q join q meet negation of q okay so this is the required dnf you know this is in the required form of dnf this is the uh, sum of elementary products okay so this is a dnf of this expression i will do another example now so no sir uh, the uh, last yes. part uh, can be omitted now uh, q intersection mm -hmm. negation yeah that is okay uh, that is okay but basically what i'm saying that uh, that is also okay so basically what happens that's what i'm going to tell this is not a unique you know somebody can give get one answer another person get can get another answer in terms of definition uh, it is simply a sum of elementary products that's all right so there could be different ways uh, you can express it okay that's okay that's okay yes sir Now uh, another example. Uh, this time I'll take another example. Uh, negation of P meet Q, and if and only if P union Q. Uh, so of course this example will be a little bit lengthy, but I will try to do it for you. So this is equivalent to. You see. Since P if and only if Q is same thing as P meet Q join negation of P meet negation of Q. This is from the previous results, you know, for the proposition logic. Since this happens, I'm going to apply it here where this is our P and this is our Q, right? So what we are going to get, this whole thing is equivalent to negation of P meet Q meet p join q right join negation of negation of p meet q join 
negation of p join q right so then i can apply a uh, kind of de morgan's law de morgan's law at here actually you know and also here okay and we simplify uh, the entire thing so this will be nothing but so now i i don't write all the time what apply law i'm applying i'm just writing it now negation of p join negation of q meet p join q join p meet q meet negation of p uh, meet negation of q right I just applied the de Morgan's law. Here, this will be the same thing as p meet q, and so on. Then I apply the distributive law. So I'm I will be getting something like negation of p meet p join negation of q meet p join negation of p meet q join negation of q meet q join p p meet q meet negation of p meet negation of q right this simplifies this to what is known as again after simplification this is i'm just writing the whole thing now negation of p meet negation of p join negation of q p join negation of p meet q join negation of q q join p q negation of p negation of q okay so this is one form of course this is not unique okay uh, but that's okay you know so DNF is not unique. Similarly, CNF is also not unique. Conjunctive normal form is also not unique. Okay, so this is an example for this. Now, I can similarly write down definition for the other part. A formula which is equivalent to a given formula that, uh, which consists of a product of elementary sum sum is called a conjunctive normal form or cnf so cnf is also not unique uh, let me one or one one example maybe Okay. The first one example here P implies is Q meet negation of Q. So this is equivalent to negation of P join Q meet negation of Q. This is in conjunctive normal forms. This is our CNR. Okay. So this is all uh, about CNF and uh, DNF. Uh, actually, I can also describe now what is known as principal disjective normal form, uh, which is another special case. Principal. Disjunctive normal form. P DNF. Okay. So, few definitions. P and Q are proposition variables. Okay. Conjunctions. Conjunctions such as P meet Q, P meet negation of Q, negation of P meet Q, 
negation of P meet negation of Q are known as mini terms. Okay. In all these uh, expressions, P or negation of P appears or also Q or negation of Q appears. Okay. Therefore, each variables occurs uh, either negated or non-negated. But both uh, negated and non-negated forms of variable do not occur together in the conjunction, right? So, also note that P meet Q and Q meet P are same. Okay, they are the same thing. So, in general, for n variables, there are two raised for n min terms, right? For n variables, there are two raised for n min terms, many terms, okay? So, uh, so each mini term is a conjunction in which each variable occurs once either. So I should write it down this. Each mini term is a conjunction in which each variable occurs once either in the negated form or in the non-negated form. Okay. So basically, uh, now I can give you the definition. For a given formula, an equivalent formula consisting of disjunctions. of min terms of mini terms only is known as its principal disjunctive normal form okay so this is a basic definition this is also known as sum of products of canonical form. Okay, so now I think uh, I can give you the truth, truth table for these things. You see, P, Q, P, meet Q. For these mini terms, I am just computing this truth table. Negation of P of Q, negation of P meet negation of Q. Now you can see that if this is true, this is false, this is true, this is false, this is false, this is false, this is true, this is false, this is false, this is true, this is false, this is false. If this is false, this is true, this is false, this is false, this is true, this is false. Then finally, if this is false, 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 this is true. Sir, I think in the th third, first row, th fourth column, it will be true. Which one? True, false, false, true. This is true, yes. Uh, above, above, above that. Sorry, this... the first column, yes. two values are true, false, true, false, same. For second row. Hmm? 
negation q will be true and t uh, p and negation q will be uh, t and t so it will be true one minute one minute let me, let me sir in first column the q will be true not false first, first row first row first row the q will be true yes you want to say this is true yes. oh yeah yes 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 you are right right you are you are right because this is true 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 false 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 true and false false all four possibilities should be there right right which is fine yeah okay so observe that uh, you know so basically we are looking at these 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 variables you know these are the mini terms you can see that uh, only one entry in mini term is true right here it is true here it is true here it is true and here it is true right only one entry in the mini term is true right okay so this is uh, an important observation okay so sir, PDNF is not the same as DNF. It is the sum of products only. No, no but this is here actually. So uh, it requires many terms to be uh, there, you know. So for a given formula on a formal consistent, of course, every P in the PDNF will be DNF anyway, right? That will be true. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, that is true. Okay. So I think uh, let me do one example here for you. So that to find PDNF of for sorry for P join negation of Q. Okay. So now actually you can see that I mean these things are same thing as P join Q meet negation of q okay join negation of p meet uh, p join negation of p all these formulas we need to apply you know is equal to p q join p meet q okay join negation of p meet negation of p join negation of q join negation of p Okay, which is same thing as P join, sorry, P meet Q, join P meet negation of Q, join, okay, negation of P meet negation of Q. So everything is in the form of meet here, right? Okay, so this is how we can actually compute these things. I think. Uh, Similarly, uh, you know, we can do the PCNF, you know, I just give you one table here for PCNF. Principal. Conjunctive normal form. Okay, so PCNF, that was PDNF. So here we have P, Q, P join Q, means sum, negation of P join Q, P join negation of Q, negation of P join negation of Q. Okay, these are all join, means sum. This is true, 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 P, Q. True, and this is false, right? Then true, false, true, false, true, true, false, true, 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 false, true, false, 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 true, true, true. Okay. So in this case, now you can see that. So actually, these are known as max term. So max term, rather than min term, we we use a term max term, right? And see so that each of the max term has a truth value. Act. There is only one false in each case, right? So they are kind of dual, right?
so basically uh, pcnf is what is consisting of conjunction pcnf is nothing but conjunction of max terms only okay is known as pcnf so i think uh, i will give you one more example and that's all so example is point pcnf for p if and only if q now p if and only if q is same thing as p implies this q meet q implies this p right which is same thing as negation of p join q meet negation of q join p so this is your answer because you see that this is in terms of max term okay so this is pcnf i think uh, that's all you know for the logic business that we i wanted to tell you now let me start something beautiful here now today okay so this was all about logic Okay. Now I am going to uh, start a very new topic, uh, which is known as uh, theoretical computer science. Uh, these slides I have borrowed by Professor Bush. Uh, th I, I always thank him for giving the permission to use his slides here. Uh, you know, these slides are really nice slides. So, because it takes a lot of time so and effort to make these slides. So, I am really thankful to him. He allowed me to use these slides uh, in the course. So, okay. So, he was at Lusania, Lusania State University. Now, I think he moved to some new other university, but these slides are still available. I will share these things uh, with you. So this is all about uh, theoretical computer science. Uh, there are many books. For example, this book is Michael Sipser. But I think uh, in your uh, book, uh, it is given. Uh, you know, uh, one chapter is given in your book, uh, Kenneth Rosen. Okay. So we talk about, uh, you know, one very basic thing that uh, in this uh, uh, this topic we study. Uh, we actually want to see what is the power of your computer. So let me actually share with you that, oh, sorry, one very basic thing that that in a uh, is a computer science summary actually that I want to tell you. What is the computer science summary? Computer science says that. So actually, this summary was given by uh, you know one linguistic professor, Norm Chomsky. Says that uh, there are only four kind of machines in the world. You know, the first one is. Finite automata. This is known as finite automata. Okay. On the top of it, we have push down automata. Okay, this is known as push down automata. Then uh, on the top of it, there is LBA. Linear bounded automata. And finally, we have Turing machine given by Alan Turing. 
okay so uh, this uh, this is the summary of computer science it says that there are only four kind of machines possible in this world so finite automata the best example of finite automata machine is uh, vending machine when you put a coin in a vending machine and you know either chips or cold drink is out okay so they implement uh, finite automata. Uh, so finite automata is a brain of that machine. Similarly, push down automata. With the finite automata, you add a temporary memory, so it is no, it becomes push down automata. Okay, and uh, then push down automata with two memories is equivalent to what is known as Turing machine. Turing machine again is a pen and uh, paper machine. You know, it's the first computer uh, computer that was developed on pen with pen and paper in 1936 by Alan Turing uh, while answering uh, David Hilbert's uh, uh, decision problem uh, which was the open problem given by David Hilbert in 1900. So this is an interesting machine and I think uh, most of your computers whether it is a supercomputer, laptop, any other computer that you use is equivalent to Turing machine. So this is a very very important machine that we see here. Okay. So each machine accepts certain languages. Okay, and each language has some grammar. Language has a grammar, right? So, finite automata accepts regular languages. Okay, then we have context-free languages, then context-sensitive languages, and then we have finally recursively enumerable language. This is the final machine. So basically we have regular grammar, okay, regular grammar, so we have context free grammar, we have context sensitive grammar, and we have unrestricted grammar. So this slide summarizes it's very important. Our entire computer science is summarized by this slide. Okay, so there are only four kind of machines, and each machine uh, accepts certain kind of languages, and each language has certain kind of grammar. So we are going to, in the next four or five lectures, we are going to look at some of these machines, except linear bounded automata, because we are not going to look at LBA. Linear bounded automata is a special kind of Turing machine. When the tape is fixed, the tape where we can do computation is fixed actually okay then we get linear bounded automata from the turing machine as a special case you can see okay so this is a summary so let me actually give you uh, so uh, in the next class uh, so basically in the next uh, some of the lectures i'm going to cover uh, some of the basic things uh, like First, I will start with finite automata but i think before starting any of these machines i should tell you about how they work I'm going to tell you uh, some mathematical preliminaries, especially set theory. Uh, the set theory, uh, you know, and relations you might have encountered in your uh, 10 plus 2 syllabus, right? In 11th and 12th, you might have done these things. So we will revise briefly uh, because those things are necessary to understand uh, this part of computer science, okay? So let me now show you. Uh, So actually we ask these kind of questions uh, like what computation problems can each model solve, right? We, we saw there are four models of computers, right? Finite automata, push down automata, linear bounded automata and Turing machine. What kind of problems they solve? So essentially uh, you should note that uh, uh, your uh, uh, finite automata can solve certain kind of problems. Then the more powerful machine is push down automata more powerful machine than push down automata is linear bounded automata and Turing machine is the ultimate thing. But then there are certain problems which even Turing machine cannot solve. So that is known as Turing barrier, okay? So a widely accepted model of computation is there is a CPU and there is a memory, right? So the different components of memory are temporary memory, program memory, input, output, right? So there is a CPU, right? So how it works? some input is given so example suppose we want to compute fx is equal to x cube okay so program memory compute x into x and compute then x square into x this is the program memory 
now you execute it through some input okay input x is equal to 2 so it goes into the temporary memory you compute the values right as one minute z is equal to 2 into 2 which is 4 and then f of x is equal to 2 into 2 for the right so actually it should be uh, whatever is the value 2 here you multiply it with 2 that will be your value of x so 4 into 2 is 8 so actually computation is 8 so output of this function f of x equal to x cube is 8 right so this is your output so this is how a, memo, a normal CPU, central processing unit, works in a computer, right? So so basically, uh, this is uh, this whole process is known as automation. There is a temporary memory, so input, output, program memory. So this whole process, CPU and program memory is known as automation. OK? So automation can be described in terms of state and transition, so which is known as transition diagram so we have uh, cpu plus cpu plus program memory is defined in terms of states and certain transitions so we are in a state this state they move and go to the another transition and so on that's what we are going to describe by these four machines okay so different uh, kinds of as i told you automata are distinguished by the temporary memory so finite automata no temporary memory in finite automata there is no memory push down automata there is a stack memory okay something goes in and then push and pop it can push something out so it can push something in and it can pop something out then there is a turing machine which has random access memory so memory affects computational power more flexible memory results to the solution of more comp uh, computational problems you know so as i told you finite automata there is no temporary memory there is input output and there is a finite automation so elevators vending machine Lexical analyzers are also, these are small computing powers. Push down automata, there is a temporary memory stack which can give you push and pop, which can you can do push and pop. You can push one by one and you can pop one by one. So push down automata, there is a, this automation input output and okay, uh, this kind of memory. So they have medium uh, computing power. Examples are parsers for programming languages are uh, build on this concept, push down automata. Okay, quite useful concept. Then Turing machine. Turing machine is the highest computing power. Example: any algorithm is equivalent to Turing machine. Actually, you know, so the memory is a random access memory. Okay, so we are going to describe these uh, machines in detail in the next four or five lectures. So as I told you, simple problems, finite automata, more complex problems, push on automata, hardest problem, Turing machine. More power, it solves more computational problems. This side is less power, it can solve less uh, less kind of uh, uh, problems, right? Less computation, uh, 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 less uh, uh, complex problems, you know? So Turing machine is the most powerful uh, known computational model. So one can ask a question, can Turing machine solve all computation problems? Answer is no, there are unsolvable problems that Turing machine cannot solve. And uh, you know, uh, there is one uh, halting problem, uh, which was, uh, which cannot be solved by Turing machine that was shown by Alan Turing in 1936. So problems you can classify in terms of complexity, uh, uh, P problems and NP class problems. P problems means, when you can solve uh, certain problems in polynomial time uh, in you know, in deterministic Turing machine, okay? I'm going to describe these things little, later on in details. And if you can solve, uh, 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 there are problems which takes uh, polynomial time on non-deterministic Turing machine, uh, those are known as NP class problem, you know? And NP complete problems, you know, uh, so they, these problems takes exponential time to solve if you solve in on the, Classical Turing machine on the deterministic Turing machine. Machine, okay. So these are some very very general introduction of uh, these four machines. So let me now describe to you uh, mathematical preliminaries.
again i am using the slides of professor bush okay to build these things so what are these things set functions relations graphs and i will i will also talk about certain proof techniques okay so what is a set set is a collection of elements so one question i would like to ask uh, is this definition correct any collection of set any collection of elements will be a set they should be unique so in fact a proper definition is a collection of well defined objects okay well defined objects is is a set what do you mean by well defined object can you tell me what do you mean by well defined objects any idea sir we can say that a particular element belongs to a set or not uh, with no ambiguity correct very good very good so basically uh, uh, we so basically uh, a set is a collection of well defined objects well defined objects means given an element and given a collection i should be able to say for surety that this element belong uh, belongs to this collection or not right if that rule is well defined uh then we will be able to do that actually so now first t problem to you give an example of a collection of elements which is not well defined okay this is a t problem for you give an example of a collection of elements which is not well defined is it okay to everyone this is the first t problem for today okay then you can represent sets by you know these small letters right finite set infinite set these are infinite set right s is equal to j such that j is positive and j is equal to 2k for some k positive right or s is equal to all those j such that j is non negative and even or 2 4 6 8 10 and so on this is infinite set a to k is a finite set or you know right so you can define set to be finite or infinite we can use venn diagram uh, so if a is 1 2 3 4 5 5 and universal set is 1 to 10 then we can circle it like this 1 2 3 4 5 5 is an a which is part of bigger set u the universal set is all possible elements in this case u is equal to 1 2 3 up to 10 we can do certain operations on the set if a is 1 2 3 and b is 2 3 4 5 5 we can call what is union a union b is when it is belongs to a as well as it b both right a union b right so it is 1 2 3 three, and 2 3 is common and 4 5 is there so 1 2 3 4 5 is the union then we can define intersection what is common between them only it is two and three elements right then we can talk about difference a minus b all those elements which is in a but not in b right so these are this there is only one element if you see a Two and three are part of B, so we can remove them, and only one is left. So A minus B is one. Similarly, we can define B minus A is four comma five. All those elements in B, which is not in A, right? So you know, four and five are the only elements in B which is not in A. So which is four and five, right? We can represent everything like this Venn diagram. Okay, so that is okay. okay so complement so we can actually find a complement of a set uh, using what is known as universal set right so given a set a so if a is equal to 1 2 3 a complement of a will be 4 5 6 7 if universal set is 1 to 7 so we can remove those things right complement of a and it's again complement is a itself right this is also fairly straight forward any question up to this point because this set theory is is well known to you right i'm just uh, recalling all the basic concepts that you know okay okay then we have even integer set odd integer set right and if you can see that you know if we take numbers from 0 1 2 up to you know 7 here right so 2 0 4 6 are even 1 3 5 7 are odd okay and so complement of even is odd okay which is okay de morgan's law 
complement of A union B is same as complement of A intersection complement of B and complement of A intersection B is same thing as complement of A union complement of B. Empty set phi which has no element. S union phi is S, S intersection phi is phi, S minus phi is S and phi minus S is phi. Right? And the phi complement is the universal set. This is null set. Subset. If A is 1, 2, 3, B is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then A is subset of B. All right. We say proper subset. If every So basically, if every element of A is also an element of B, then we say that A is subset of B. Okay. So if the size of B is more, certainly, uh, you know, uh, we can say that uh, A is proper subset, right? If there, so there are elements in B which are not in A. That may be a possibility. By the way, here I would like to ask you one question. Uh, you know that set of integers, how many elements are there in the integers, right? Set of integers, how many elements are there? Infinite. 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 No, no real. Infinite. So, 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2, right? This is the set you remember. Now we know that 2z if I consider. 2z is what? Set of even integers, right? Correct? Yes, sir. Now, 2z is a proper subset of set z or not? Proper subset of z? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because all integers are the elements that are not in 2z. Now, the problem is there. How come it is possible? Uh, uh, when uh, so that means can we say that the number of elements in z and 2z is same so i'm going to confuse you now can we say that number of elements in z and 2z is same no sir no no sir no sir because odd integers no, does not belong to z hmm? but it odd integers does not belong to z but it is belonging to z mm -hmm. So this is a question. So this is again a T problem for you. I asked the question. Are they same? So it turns out that number of elements in 2z and z is same because there is one-to-one -one correspondence. Why? That means if I take Sir. yes. Yes. Pucho, what question you want to ask? Yes, who was asking the question? So you understood the question? Set of even integers is a subset of Z, right? So what I'm going to show you here, uh, if I take a map F from z to 2z it is something like this you take an element n and you will get 2n right so you give me one element in z i will give you one element in 2z you give me another element in z i will give you another element in 2z so basically there is one to one correspondence right there is one to one correspondence or not Yes, please, please ask question, you know. So that means the number of elements should be same, right? Both Z and 2Z. Sir, if we restrict the domain, then it won't be same. No, no, which domain? I have not restricted any domain. Set of integers is 0, plus minus 1, plus minus 2, and so on. And set of 2Z is all even integers, right? 0, plus minus 2, plus minus 4, and so on. Yes, anybody in the class, uh, answer me. Yes, sir, both the numbers are same. Because we have so, infinite numbers. So, both the so number of elements in both the set is same, right? Yes, Even sir. though one is proper subset of the other. Yes. 
third part we cannot de determine i think because but sir here here we, here we are going with a relation of that is 2n no that relation is telling us you give me one element uh, basically in even numbers i will give you the corresponding uh, number in set of integers if you give me an element in set of integers i will give you one even number so that means as many times as you want you pick up a number in either 2z or z i will give the corresponding element in other side so you give me if you give me one even number i will give you one integers if you give me one element in integers i will give you one one even number so that means there is one to one correspondence so that means number of elements should be same right in both the sets but how it is possible that one is a proper subset of the other sir because infinite is not a fixed sir i sir here f of z to 2z exist as one one function but if we reverse the order from 2z to 2z then it won't exist no no then also the same thing right you give me any two any even number and i will give you the corresponding integers that is not a problem sir number of integers can't be compared na no? because both are infinite yeah so though i should tell you one uh, sir because very... every infinity is then... different from another yes that yes. thing can be said with 3z 4z and n Yes, so now let me tell you one interesting story. Have you heard of uh, Hilbert Hotel? Have you heard of this uh, story, Hilbert Hotel? So there was a hotel in the town, and uh, and there were you know infinite rooms in the hotel, okay. And uh, every room was occupied. Every room was occupied. Then what happens? One day, uh, you know. then uh, one actually uh, in the, uh, you know one wedding uh, uh, happened and then the whole uh, bus full of people came there so they came there and they asked for the room and uh, then the manager said that there is no room available every every room is occupied right so then uh, you know the person from the bus uh, he said that he was a mathematician right so he said that it's very simple you know you just ask everyone to move 100 uh, so room number 1 should go into 100 plus that room number in they should go he should go into room number 101 everyone should move you know and if everybody will move to 100 rooms uh, next to their room then there will be vacancy for 100 rooms and they can be occupied and this turns out to be true how is that possible it is because there are infinitely many rooms that is a key thing so this is known as hilbert paradox actually you know so it's kind of paradox right so hilbert hotel is a famous example so in here also set of even integers looks like of course it is a proper subset of inter, uh, whole integers but actually uh, you know they have they are having same number of elements it is because the number of elements are infinite if the number of elements are finite then we cannot say this right then of course uh, you know the, it cannot it is not possible that the number of elements is same in two sets right if there are finite set so i hope you got the answer right yes sir also uh, sir can i say something yeah sure sure uh, sir also i have thought that uh, after suppose uh, we reach infinite in z which is mm -hmm. a maximum limit and if we try to double that then it will not be possible because after infinite there is no element like to infinite so this is also a kind of paradox actually you see infinite means infinite right so how many elements are there infinite and of course uh, there are uh, some uh, so in this case it's because it's a discrete sense of actually you know uh, so the uh, the cardinality in both the elements uh, both the set z and 2z is same but uh, for example uh, if you look at set of real numbers right so the real numbers are also infinite right or yes. if i ask you a question if you take a closed interval 0 and 1 how many elements are there they are also infinite so there is uh, some relationship between these infinite uh, sets as well right so number of elements in r is different than the number of elements in z or 2z whereas the number of elements in z and 2z is same 
however the number of elements in z into z is different from the set of number of elements in the real numbers okay so all these things are you know different so there is a very nice paper written by george cantor he talks about different kind of infinities so first time it was written people were confused they said this guy is mad you know what kind of infinities he is talking about but then he gave different examples and ideas actually so that's how it is okay uh, yes sir yes. anyway so it's an interesting topic then we talk about disjoint sets if there are two sets a and b uh, you know they are disjoint if nothing is common right which is okay so set cardinality means number of elements in the set here it is 3 right a is equal to 257 for finite sets now it's a power set is a very very important thing a power set is a set of sets so s is equal to a b c so power set of set is set of all subsets of s so power set here is empty set singleton a singleton b singleton c singleton a b singleton a c singleton b c singleton a b c right so obviously cardinality of power set is 2 raised to power cardinality of s right in this case it is 8 now one interesting thing you should note i can actually write pi as 0 0 0 a as 1 0 0 b as 0 1 0 c as 0 0 1 a b as 1 1 0 a c as 1 0 1 b c as b c kya hoga 0 1 1 and 1 1 1 every element of power set can be written as a binary string beautiful observation right so you know that means uh, you know given a set uh, if you look at the power set uh, we can write down in the terms of binary numbers this is very useful in uh, in discrete math sense you know people utilize you, you utilize this concept uh, quite a lot and while doing many calculations so this is an important observation in terms of power set then we can talk about Cartesian product. Okay, so Cartesian product: if a is two four, b is two three five, a cross b is equal to two 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 three two five, four two four three four five. Right? So you can write down. So Cartesian product of a cross b is Cartesian. So cardinality of a into cardinality of a cross b is cardinality of a into cardinality of b. Number of elements in a cross b same thing as number of elements in a times number of elements in b. We can generalize this to. Uh, higher number of uh, sets right a cross b cross c cross up to z right whatever you it is possible i think that's all for today so i'll stop so and i, and I will st start with functions in the next class any question at this point uh, sir i have a question sir why the power set have uh, had been given the addition of two two power s yeah because uh, basically whatever is uh, size of s that's why they call it as uh, basically you see that everything is uh, how many elements are there it's a power of two only right number of elements yes. in the power set is a power of two that's why they given the uh, notation two raised to power s so saying that sir, what is the size of s you raise it to power two right yes sir, that okay, is the sir, observation sir. yes okay sir, yes okay sir. yes sir in uh, the uh, example of uh, uh, 2z we cannot compare as the number is infinite right which number is infinite means here the set uh, we cannot compare the number of element in z and 2z uh, as in set is infinite uh, number is infinite no the number number of elements in z and number of elements in 2z is infinite now i am saying not only that the cardinality of z and cardinality of 2z is same i am saying the number of elements in z and number of elements in 2z is same that this looks like a bit odd how it is possible if 2z is a proper subset of z is still number of elements in 2z and z is same right that means number of elements in z and 2z are same yeah i i told you now i give you so you give me an element in z i will give you an element an even number you give me an even number i will give you an element in z so as many times as possible right up, you, if you can count it for thousand, two thousand, one million, one trillion, billion, zillion, whatever you, you know, you go. I will give you number. You give me one number in Z. I will give you one number in two Z. So the number of elements are same. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence here, right? This function f of n is equal to two n is one-to-one -one correspondence between the elements. You give me one element in Z. I will give you element in one element in two Z. If you give me one element in two Z, I will give you one element in Z, right? 
that's why the number of elements in both of them is same okay okay so i think that's all for today uh, in the next class we will be finishing some more uh, especially uh, uh, induction and certain proof techniques we will cover we will come finally we will finalize this set theory in functions and uh, then we will go to the languages okay so this is all